Hello everyone, I'm Abdullah Rezwan, your host of InvestTrack Podcast. I'm back again with a new episode. For tonight's show, we are glad to invite Mr. Nafiz Al Tariq. He has recently joined as head of research in City Brokerage, one of the leading brokers in Bangladesh. Prior to his current role, he has passed two successful years in managing a closed end mutual fund in Asian Tigers Capital Partners. He also spent a brief stint with Eastern Bank in Treasury Department. A workaholic by nature, Mr. Tariq also wears the entrepreneur hat whenever he gets a breathing space from his corporate role. He runs Professional Finance Studies, uh, shortly known as PFS, a training center in the field of financial modeling, equity valuation, risk management, and my MS Excel. PFS also provides preparatory services to candidates sitting for any of the two professional degrees, CFA and FRM. Nafiz Al Tariq completed his BBA and MBA from Department of Finance, University of Dhaka. He's also a CFA charter holder as well as a certified financial risk manager. Without further ado, let's just start the conversation. Hello, Nafis Bhai. Uh, welcome to our show, uh, InvestRec. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, so first of all, uh, since you have joined in equity, uh, as head of equity research in City Brokerage, uh, we'll definitely talk about that. You will definitely talk about equity research in general. Uh, we'll also talk about your prior experience in asset management. Uh, but let's just start with something that has been all over the news, media, and even social media these days our budget for 2017-18 financial year. So what's your thoughts on our recent budget? What are the positives and negatives that you see uh, from the budget that has been uh, launched uh, a few days ago? Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think uh, this is a very uh, timely discussion uh, regarding the budget because since uh, the budget uh, actually uh, took place on January, June 1 uh, and it will, it will going to be passed by uh, end of this month. Uh, so I, I think there are a lot of uh, positives on this budget because as you know the Bangladesh has uh, a growing economy uh, with a 240 billion dollar uh, economy and it's growing at a 7% plus rate and uh, government has a target uh, rate of 7.4% in the budget and also uh, the target inflation is 5.5%. Uh, so if we think that uh, the, the nominal economy is going to grow at say 13-14% mm -hmm. rate uh, so then I think a big budget is very uh, important. So a lot of people are actually uh, criticizing uh, regarding the uh, recent budget. But if you want to grow at a 13 to 14 percent rate, you, you need to reinvest. So you need to reinvest in the economy, you need to invest in infrastructure, education. And a lot of investment is needed to cater to the growth. Uh, so that's why a big budget uh, of uh, $50 million, which is around uh, 18 18% of the uh, total nominal GDP, which is needed. So I, th I, th I think that that's very uh, good uh, in terms of uh, catering to the growth of the economy. When and you also talk about a big budget, uh, so I know in terms of number, if you look at the uh, number in its face value, it seems pretty big. Yes. Uh, but 18% of GDP is it, not really that big if you compare it to other countries. Yes, it? it's not that big. Uh, so I, I, I think that this is a very good one. And uh, of that 18% of uh, GDP, you need, you need to collect the revenue also because you don't want the deficit to pile up. So uh, the, in, in the target budget, uh, the uh, revenue collection as a percentage of GDP is around 13%, uh, which means 5% uh, is the uh, deficit. So uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the last year, actually, the deficit was around 4%. So I, th I th But I th usually th that we have seen in the last few years that deficit the target deficit, let's just put it that way, has always been hovering around 5%. Yes. Uh, yes. But we have barely achieved that because our uh, expenditure target has, uh, as li uh, just like our revenue uh, collection target, has not been met in uh, any of the last few years. That's the negative part of the actually budget. I think I think that's not related to the problem with the budget. That's related to the problem with implementation. Right. So one is the budget. You are planning something. 
and the later on is that implementation. So every year we, we, we see that on, on, on January and February, the government revised the budget downward. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that's a negative part. So I think the government will realize that that implementation is very important. So as a result, the different bodies of the government, different ministry will uh, act together. Especially but, when uh, we have big infrastructure spendings coming up, like both the bridge, MRT, and all these big infrastructure spending uh, will be coming into play in next few years. So if you don't really uh, implement in terms of our, uh, in terms of the planned timeline, definitely that will have an impact on probably the real growth that you will see yes. in the next five yes, yes. to ten years. That's why you need, you need to invest now and for that you need to collect the revenue. So if you want to collect the revenue and mobilize the revenue, uh, so that that is where I think the new VAT and Supplementary Duty Act is uh, very important. In fact, it, it was uh, it is a 2012 act, but implementing this year, uh, it should have been implemented last year, but uh, due to the um, uh, many criticism around the uh, economists and business people in government wasn't able to implement it. I think uh, the implementation of the new VAT will be very important. So government will be able to mobilize the uh, revenue collection. But the problem is uh, the tone of the uh, government, we think uh, that government is trying to mobilize from the existing tax. Uh, bear. So that is something I think um, alarming because uh, when you say tax in terms of uh, indirect taxes, that is ve- uh, that. Uh, so that is basically taxing everyone, everyone in the country. Everyone, but in terms of uh, so th- isn't that a way of indirectly? Uh, widening your tax base? Yes, yes, that's that's widening of your tax base, but in terms of uh, the direct tax, the NBR tax, right. so government uh, did not disclose is like uh, how many people are added, new people added in the taxpayers, so I think the government need to broaden the tax net. So that is, I think government is trying, but uh, it's very difficult to broaden that amount also. So I think government is in the right track of bro- trying to increase the tax net. Uh, but I think that there are some negative also because government is trying to uh, increase the excise duty on the bank deposits. I think uh, that has been taken as a very ne- negative uh, among the uh, investors uh, because you are uh, actually taxing the deposits. Uh, so wherever you see that you are earning something, so your tax is directed at source, then you are saving something, and then again the tax, and then you are depositing, and on the deposit amount is also there is duty. So that is something uh, the existing taxpayers are actually not very happy. But uh, if we if we look at the broader context by uh, you know, implementing the VAT and SC Act and also uh, trying to increase the tax uh, base, so I th- I, th- I think that's that's where government is in track of trying to collect more revenue. So there is concern whether government will be able to um, implement that of 13% of total GDP or whether that will be revised. That's a separate discussion. So I, th- I think uh, in, the, in the next year, in the January and February, government will revise this downward. But I, I think in terms of planning and taking the economy forward, I think uh, this is very uh, welcoming budget. I, I understand that uh, you, you were saying that uh, about the excise duty uh, imposed on the depositors and there has been quite an outrage in social media, especially uh, on, on, on this topic. What could be a possible rationale for, uh, you know, imposing excise duty on, on, on saving deposits? Uh, I, I don't see any, any rationale. I don't see because if you, if you look at the where actually excise duty is imposed on, that's typically not in deposits. It typically uh, takes place on manufacturing mm-hmm. and import, and especially on segment that government wants to discourage. So I, I don't see any rationale for that, and I think uh, I expect uh, that in the, uh, that this amount will be lowered or eliminated. So previously there was an excise duty, yeah. uh, which was a bit lower amount, uh, up to 20,550, and up to 100,000 is uh, 500. So I, 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 th- I think in the, uh, within this month, uh, I think government will realize that this is something uh, people are not uh, accepting. So I think especially uh, when you have uh, deposit rates that are below inflation yes. across the sector. Yes, yes, and also also you, you were trying to uh, it's like implement the financial inclusion. Right. So not many people have bank account in Bangladesh. So you are trying to take people in the banking sector. Uh, so people want to uh, have a bank account, but 
uh, if you discourage them by uh, mm. it's like implementing uh, exercise gym, then people will have a discouragement and also not many people are educated enough to uh, calculate the impact of their uh, savings rate. So I think uh, people have a natural uh, thinking that uh, government is not encouraging people to have bank accounts. So I think the financial inclusion that government is trying to implement that won't, be take, uh, won't take place if that is uh, implemented. You also mentioned that uh, government is also uh, go government also seems to be you know uh, probably taking more out of the existing tax taxpayers, right? Uh, what, what what why do you say that? Uh, because uh, government is, is not actually uh, mentioning uh, how much additional people will be added uh, in the. Uh, in the system because uh, if you look at the actual number of taxpayers uh, i think there are more people who are able to pay tax but uh, in bangladesh a lot of people actually hide the tax uh, especially uh, business people even in, in case of vat a lot of businesses don't pay the vat they collect the vat from the customers but they don't pay enough vat to the government so that actually taken as a margin for those small and uh, medium businesses so that, that's uh, act, that's actually a concern that uh, is shared by many many people even within the industry and uh, probably outside the industry as well that uh, the companies would be uh, you know following this vat law the the, the ones who will be paying this 15% vat uh, will probably be uh, at a disadvantaged situation from the ones uh, who, which would not pay these VATs. So, in terms of implementing the VAT law, is probably the bigger concern than the law itself. Yes, yes, uh, and that's where government will need to uh, build up the infrastructure uh, where people will not be able to hide it. So, I think that, that will come over time because this is an implementation stage, the starting stage. So, I think over time you will see that um, the people will find it very difficult to hide the VAT. Uh, I was asking about the uh, about the question that wh why you think that uh, the existing taxpayers are being uh, imposed even higher uh, you know tax burden uh, because what I what I have seen that uh, it wasn't that that the tax rate has been increased it's just remained static. Uh, I think if you look at the inflation rate and uh, the the amount of, the, of tax free threshold is uh, two hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, right. Per main and for women is 300,000. Uh, but if you look at the inflation, so uh, on a natural basis it should be increased. So if you're taking account of inflation, it, the number should take place somewhere around 280,000. So I expect the tax free threshold to be increased by 25,000. Uh, so but the ar ar argument that uh, finance minister actually gave in, in his budget, I think that was quite compelling in terms of uh, not increasing the tax free threshold because uh, our country's GDP per capita is $1,500. So, and you are having tax-free income up to probably $3,000. Yes. So that's I, I think there there is probably not a single country in the world where you have your tax-free income threshold double your GDP per capita. Uh, yes, but I think I think uh, since you are uh, implementing the VAT, so people will have to pay the VAT also, sir. So, so people are not ready to take all the burden at a time. So I think it could be increased by 25,000. I don't think it will have serious impact on mm -hmm. government's revenue and also uh, on the individual taxpayers. So I think it's about the tone that people are getting. Right. So they would have increased the confidence. So it could have been done uh, with, with phases. So since we, we know that we have to pay that, so that's, that's an increased burden for me. So if uh, there is certain level of inflation, but uh, the amount of threshold is not increased, so we, we take that as a negative tone. Okay, okay. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of budget, probably we can talk all day if you want. Yes. Uh, so let's just leave it that way. Uh, now let's come to the currency part. You know, okay. there has been uh, a lot of talks about currency, uh, whether it should be devalued or whether it should be stable going forward. Uh, and in fact, Bangladesh uh, currency has been stable for probably last three, four, five years. Yes. Uh, so, is it the right time? Uh, the government should take, the central bank should take an active stance in terms of devaluing the currency, uh, or do you think it should be stable to, uh, you know, generate confidence in the uh, currency? I, th I think it's a uh, timely adjustment of currency uh, because if you have seen from 2000, uh, mid-2012 to uh, end of 2016, uh, the currency remained at the same level as around 78 to 79 mm -hmm. over around. 
uh, but in the, in the meantime, uh, Bangladeshi uh, inflation uh, averaged more than probably 6% if you take it just five years. Uh, and if you take the inflation of foreign countries, their inflation is too low. So uh, say for example, if US inflation is 2% and Bangladesh inflation is 6%, so according to purchasing power parity uh, theory, the currency of the country whose inflation is higher, that currency should be uh, depreciated. Now, if that depreciation doesn't take place, what will happen? So, if that de depreciation doesn't take place, in case of your um, real exchange rate will appreciate. Mm -hmm. So, if your real exchange rate appreciate, then your uh, export will lose the competitiveness. So, if you want your country to grow, then your export needs to grow as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you lose competitiveness, and at the same time, you have seen that uh, the Eurozone economy, uh, that was in uh, like a bit shaky in these uh, years. So mm -hmm. as a result, uh, if our export doesn't grow, then we will have a larger trade uh, deficit. So if you have larger trade deficit, and at a time when remittance is not actually flowing, in fact, you have seen the negative growth in remittance, which mm -hmm. was not expected in the last few years, but due to the uh, decrease in oil price, so we have seen a, a degrowth in remittance. So current account is in a negative balance, and this negative balance will increase if you don't devalue your currency and your export doesn't become competitive. And if uh, there is not much inflow in terms of foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment to cover up that deficit, then your balance of payment will be negative. So as a result, your reserve will come down. So the whole ecosystem is related to uh, currency. So mm -hmm. if you your real exchange rate appreciate too much, so I think that will have uh, actually uh, a problem on other in, uh, like economic indicators like current account deficit, balance of payment, mm -hmm. interest rate, reserve. So I think that this is a timely adjustment and over time if this inflation continue to uh, increase compared to other countries, so over time you will see uh, the devaluation. Especially when probably almost every country in the frontier universe and every trade uh, competitors of Bangladesh has depreciated their currency significant in last three four years so probably we'll see some currency devaluation yes that, 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 that was on the card in fact in fact we have already seen that yes in probably last two three months yes in fact in the, in the, in the month of april uh, there is a massive depreciation so uh, from january to april we have seen currency depreciated by around five percent mm -hmm. so i think i think uh, at, at, at around 83 to 84 it's, it's comfortable zone uh taka dollar rate yeah five percent for currency uh, currency devaluation is massive. Uh, yes, in, in, in a three to four three months to four massive, months. but you have to take account that in the last five years it was uh, very the same, same place. Right, right. So, so more broadly speaking, uh, what are some of the things that probably need to be addressed as early as possible in Bangladesh uh, that are not probably not uh, looked at as closely as some of the other key stakeholders in Bangladesh? I think Bangladesh is in a very uh, sweet spot uh, to be a breakout nation. Uh, uh, when we uh, talk about different nations uh, of growth history, uh, we, we looked at uh, Japan in 1950 to 1970, then uh, we have example of uh, China uh, and some other neighboring Asian countries have grown very well. Uh, but I think Bangladesh is in a very sweet spot to take off for a growth of 7 to 8 percent for the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, because of uh, uh, everyone knows of the demographic dividend that we have very young population uh, and also uh, the economic base of the economy is very low so uh, growing at a real GDP of 7 to 8 percent is not that difficult at this level but uh, you have to keep in mind that even if you have all the positive things uh, if you not manage all these things well then Bangladesh will not be able to uh, grow so I think uh, for Bangladesh uh, a big problem is uh, regarding the uh, politics uh, because every five years we see political violence uh, and also at this moment there is um, uh, not enough challenges on the opposite side so we need also a good opposition who can challenge the uh, government who can take the government so government will be always uh, on their toes uh, so that if they don't do well uh, so they will lose power so I think uh, in the political arena we need some challenges but uh, we also need a very stability we don't want to see violence in every uh, five years so that's one important thing and another thing is I think uh, for the Bangladesh is important is like reducing the corruption 
because at every level you see uh, the corruption and because of the corruption the uh, growth the level of growth that we can achieve i think we can achieve 9 to 10 percent growth easily uh, mm -hmm. given the base of our economy but we are growing at six to seven percent rate in fact uh, yesterday uh, the world bank uh, projected the Bangladesh economy will grow at 6.8 percent the government has a target of 7.4 percent we can debate on that but uh, i think um, uh, the reducing corruption is uh, very important and another uh, thing is i think the quality of the human uh, capital. So I think uh, government needs to increase uh, investment, quality investment in uh, education. Uh, and we can see there is a deterioration in the uh, education system. So uh, people at this moment, those who are affluent, uh, don't have much confidence uh, sending their child in the uh, Bengali medium. So they are taking the English medium route. But I th if you look at the broader economy, I think you have to uh, fix up the education system so that people can learn and they can compete with the world. So mm -hmm. I think I think investing in education is very important, uh, reducing the corruption. Uh, and also another thing, if you look at the, at, uh, in terms of population, how much people are actually living in Dhaka and Chidawang. So these are the two cities actually uh, mm -hmm. having more uh, purchasing power, but uh, you have to decentralize that also. So if you, if you look at the uh, traffic jam of Dhaka and also Chidawang, so it's getting horrendous. So I think Bopin needs to decentralize the economy so that people go to other um, the districts as well. Other districts should have growth. So growth should be dispersed so that there is not much uh, the uh, income disparity at the tolerable level. So if right. the income, your economy is growing at a very high rate, but if income disparity increases, then Especially will, between the regions. Yes, uh, in that case, it will increase the social unrest, political violence. These are uh, actually a consequence of those uh, income uh, disparities. So at, at this point, everybody comes wants to come to Dhaka. Yes. And everybody, if you, everybody wants to come to Dhaka, that will definitely have some implications for the city itself and the country itself. Yes. Uh, and I think we are already seeing that in yes. terms of traffic jam and all these things. Uh, I think that is a manifestation of. Uh, the centralization that you have talked about. Yes, so I think decentralization is very important and uh, good governance at all levels, not only on the political level, also in business level. So we, we don't see uh, companies have a very good governance policy. So I think good governance is very uh, good corporate governance and good governance in the political area is very important. Okay, okay. Uh, final question from our broad discussion on macroeconomy. Uh, are you concerned about the banking sector's asset quality? extremely concerned because at this moment I'm thinking about uh, where to uh, keep deposit because uh, there is huge concern regarding the deterioration of the uh, asset quality. Mm -hmm. uh, also in the budget you have seen that uh, around 2000 crore taka has been separated for recapitalization of the uh, state-owned banks and that has been taken. And this is not one of, this is this seems to be a consistently, yes, yes. Re, uh, probably, you know, recapitalizing through taxpayers. I think money. this is the third year of uh, recapitalization yeah. and uh, that is uh, simply something people, good taxpayers, uh, they are dis disincentivized. So uh, if every time, so you, you are actually promoting uh, by continuously recapitalizing this uh, state-owned bank. So uh, there, are, there are some private banks, uh, so some good private banks, but there are some private banks that are also very politicized. So uh, I, I think at this moment, uh, finding out uh, seven to eight banks is very difficult where you have uh, huge confidence that these banks will continue to stay for the next 15 to 20 years. So that's a, that's a concern for me. And also in, in terms of uh, economic turmoil, when uh, one or two banks fall, um, then even the banks who are having good asset quality right. is very difficult because you have seen some other countries, the contagion effect. So uh, at this moment, people don't, general people don't believe that banks can uh, fall. Right. So, so, but I think at some point of time, if we see one or two big banks fail to pay their uh, deposits money, depositors money, in that case I think it will be very concerned and it will have a contagion effect which I think we haven't experienced. So I think we are not ready uh, to uh, how we can uh, act on that right. changing environment. So that's a very concern for me and that's why I think people, many people are going through the national savings uh, certificate, certificate and that rate is very high compared to the overall deposit rate. Uh, I haven't told about uh, these things regarding our budget discussion mm -hmm. but I think at this moment government should think about that also because if government doesn't reduce the rate, 
uh, then the national service study will be pile up which already taking place and the government's burden on paying the interest will increase in this budget you have seen that and the government seven, will have to probably impose higher tax going forward yes going forward <laughs> so i think i think that's a legitimate concern uh, but we don't have enough uh, asset allocation right. uh, opportunity so i think uh, we have to face that it's interesting that you mentioned that even the good banks can uh, face tough situation if some some bad banks fall because of asset quality issues. Uh, the interesting thing about banking sector is that it's not like, for example, a manufacturing industry or let's say biscuit industry. So if that leading biscuit manufacturer fails, the second one or third one will take that opportunity and grab as much market share yes. as possible yes. uh, without affecting the consumers, without affecting anyone in the system. Uh, but if a bank falls, even if it's a bad one, it will have ripple effect, it will have repercussion across the system. Yes. So that's probably one of the major differentiation between a banking sector and any other sector. Yes, the general. financial system is all about trust. So if right. you don't trust the bank, exactly. you won't trust anyone, even the good bank. So that will have a major uh, negative effect on the economy. Right. So like, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of the discussion that since you have joined in the uh, as head of research in city brokerage, we will definitely go uh, definitely talk about equity research in depth. So just tell our listeners uh, the role of research in investing decision. The role of research is very, very important, which is not actually widely understood by the uh, investors community in Bangladesh. And in fact, not only about the investor community, in fact, I think uh, the employers also don't really, not many employers understand the importance of quality research. Uh, and when I'm talking about research, though we are actually operating in equity market, but I think uh, it should be for broader case because we have just discussed about the bank. So right. if you want to have a deposit, a fixed deposit for two years or one year, you need to think about which bank you are depositing at. Some banks are offering you 9 to 10 percent and some banks are offering you 6 percent. Why there is 3 percent difference? Mm -hmm. So there is obviously greatest risk you are taking. But whenever our investor, especially the retail investor who doesn't have enough financial literacy, uh, they think investing in actually keeping deposit banks is actually risk free. That's a general, uh, con actually common understanding among uh, the people who doesn't have the financial literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you actually also... Yeah, may, probably I have heard and probably you have heard many, many times this before that a lot of people ask me, for example, which bank, which bank is giving the highest rate. Yes. They want to know that. Yes. You know, and probably if I say this, this is the bank that is paying the highest, they will just go there and put their money yes. in that particular bank but without they, thinking or without understanding or appreciating the uh, importance of credit risk in the process. Yes, that's where the research comes in. So if you do some sort of research, why this bank is giving higher rate and the other bank is giving lower rate, if you look at their credit history, if you look at their uh, board and other things, so you will understand that there is certain amount of credit risk you are taking. And not many people are able to take high risk. So you have to understand your risk tolerance and also. Uh, and also even if you want to buy a car or if, if you want to buy a flat, mm -hmm. you do due diligence mm -hmm. where I would want to buy a flat, at what rate, which car I will buy. So those are the things very important. And in terms of equity investment, that's even more important because when you are keeping deposit in banks, uh, you are very comfortable with a certain level of interest rate, which is uh, usually fixed. Uh, but when you are investing in equity, you don't know mm -hmm. what amount to use. So many, 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 many companies with very poor governance don't pay dividend. Uh, every year they're giving stock dividend, but uh, the company is not growing that much. So I think I think I think it's very important for the investors, retail and also institutional investors, to understand that research is very important. So if you do research, then you will be able to understand which company is more risky and which company is less risky. How much risk you will be able to tolerate, and whether mm -hmm. that risk and your risk tolerance matches, and whether you should go for investment. If you look at the first three months of this year. Uh, the market rallied around 13% in the first uh, three months and everyone uh, actually was not listening to the research people mm -hmm. because uh, I was finding very hard people listening to my comments. So at some point or I started commenting on this because people is like throwing dart and every stock mm -hmm. they are investing is going up by 2 to 3% in 2 to 3 days. Then they are saying that yes, I, I, I have 
invested, I did not listen to you, and my portfolio is going up. So why should I listen to you? So that's very short-termism thinking. Right. But you can see later on, in the following two months, the market decreased by 5% around. But those who haven't allocated their asset in terms of how much risk they take, and the portfolio is not well diversified, their portfolio reduced by 10 to 12%, which is which can easily go down if you don't right. do research well. So I think the role of research is very important. And again, uh, we need to increase the amount of understanding among the uh, investors and also the employers uh, and everyone in the country uh, that you need to do some research before investing. Uh, you mentioned a lot about, uh, you, you sounded like research should do a lot of check and balance uh, should work like a check and balance system in the process. So I'm just, uh, you know, uh, probably curious to know whether research can protect us from a crash like it happened in 2010 in Bangladesh. I think uh, the answer can be both yes and no. Uh, so uh, the answer is yes, uh, if you think uh, that the research is unbiased one, uh, you, you assume that people are uh, rational. Of course, that's, that's the assumption uh, I'm taking. Yes. That research. Uh, so we are dealing with uh, quality research. Yes, uh, quality research. The research is unbiased and also um, people uh, who act on this research, uh, they are rational, uh, they are homo economicus, so they don't have self-control problem, uh, they don't have overconfidence bias, so they'll be able to find companies that are actually fair valued. Uh, or at least undervalued, not overvalued, uh, and they want to take that position. And when the stock becomes stock or any securities become overvalued, uh, they they will sell. But the problem happens uh, when you do research. Some point of time, uh, people have uh, their own conflict of interest. In many cases, uh, people have uh, overconfidence bias because whenever you do research, you think you know all the information, but in reality, you don't know all the information. Right. So there are a certain amount of risk. So the fair value you are calculating that may not exist because there are a lot of information that's not it's in based your, on control, your, assumptions. your assumption. So I think at, at a certain point of time, uh, investors also behave irrationally. Uh, I already told, told about that in the first three months, people behave right. irrationally. So at some point of time, market can rally too much compared to the economic fundamentals of the company and the industry and the economy. So if that, that takes place, so there is a certain amount of bubble that can take place. And not every bubble ended up with a crash. There can be a bubble, but that bubble takes a bit, uh, it stays overvalued the market for a long period long of time without having a crash. That can happen. Uh, uh, there is a general understanding among the mass people that if there is a bubble, a crash is uh, inevitable, but actually that may not take place. But I think uh, whenever whenever that bubble becomes too much, like what we have seen in 2010, from 2008, the Dhaka General Index was around 3,000 and it, it reached almost close to 9,000. Right. And you can see at that point of time, there's a uh, the interest rate was low and there was huge money supply in the economy, broad money grown at 24% rate. Uh, so I think at that point of time, there was a huge bubble that has to be, uh, actually, there has to be a crash was inevitable. So without that crash, you won't see uh, that uh, investors have a much confidence investing in stocks. So whenever you do research and you don't find any company that is undervalued, I think there is a certain sort of bubble, but if there is too much bubble, there can be a crash. So now, coming back to your question, whether research can protect us, Yes, it can protect us if we behave rationally. But human beings are, are irrational at some point of time. So market uh, are not efficient all the time. And in a Bangladesh economy, it's, it's, it's even it's, I, I would say it's weak from inefficient market. Mm -hmm. So so there is scope for overvaluation and undervaluation. And also uh, in, in our country, there is not much scope for selling short stock. So if the stock goes overvalued, it remains overvalued for a, a certain period of time. Uh, so I think. Uh, Do you think we should be allowed to sell sell stocks short? Uh, we should start it at some point of time. Though in our our country it's very difficult because the retail participation is huge, and also some of the in, institutional investors are behaving uh, like. It's hard to differentiate. Uh, yes, uh, like <laughs> retail investors. So uh, at this uh, taking that into account, I think Bangladesh economy is not at this moment ready. 
but again like that VAT implementation at some point of time you have to uh, start selling allowing the uh, investors to sell short but with appropriate risk management mm -hmm. because uh, it's like uh, when you are selling short actually it's, it's a leverage transaction so we have seen what happened in 2009 and 2010 the bubble took place because there was huge amount of margin loan right. uh, so people would able to buy stock at one is to two margin mean you have 100 taka you, you are allowed to buy 200 taka people take loan from bank take that money in the broker's account as their equity and, and be super they, leveraged yes so there's a three to four time leverage so that leverage has to be gone so i think uh, the risk management profession is not also fast uh, that that's very mature stage at this moment so if you allow that uh, there has to be a certain level of risk management and again the education financial education among the people is very important so we, we keep talking about uh, the risk management process uh, that probably is lacking in this country uh, so that uh, probably leads to the question of return expectation for the investors yes. uh, what should be the possible or rational if i put it that way uh, in the return expectation for investors and and what could be the time horizon for for what should be the time horizon for investments okay i think for let's come to time horizon first uh, it, it depends on person it's like and uh, investment objective also uh, say uh, i'm at my uh, early 30s and uh, i'm saving for my retirement so if i would like to retire at 50 or 55 or 60 i have around 20 to 30 years of time horizon so I have the scope to uh, invest with a certain amount of risk, I can afford to take risk. Uh, so my re return expectation should be higher. But another person who is say for example uh, 50 years old or 55 years old and they uh, would like to retire in 5 to 10 years. So their time horizon is a bit shorter compared to my still that's 5 to 10 years is very long but compared to my time horizon their time horizon is short. And also if you want to uh, invest say for example you want to uh, start a business in five years of time so you want to save and accumulate capital so then your time horizon is not that long like 20 to 30 years yeah probably so, five years is not a very long time because if you in 20, 2010 you have invested your money you would still be in huge loss yes so probably in, in investing in equity you have to think about like three to five years is very short term very short term. Term. but people have a uh, have an understanding here because as i say that the amount of financial literacy is not enough there so people think like one or two years is very long term. Mm -hmm. So that's not actually the taking place. So I think um, uh, you, you have to invest according to your investment objective. So your investment objective will define your uh, time horizon. So if I am investing for my like kid, say I'm investing for my daughter. So when she will be around 18 to 20 years old, she can take that money and invest mm -hmm. and uh, can take admission in a in an university where um, there is a lot of money needed so I can save for that so for that I have 20 years of time horizon so but if you want to like start a business or buy a car in two to three uh, years of time then, they, then your uh, time horizon is very short so according to that you have to decide on the uh, return expectation and also you have to think about how the economy is growing our economy nominal economy is growing at 13 to 14 percent so at this moment achieving 12 to 15 percent uh, investment return by investing in equities is possible uh, but if you want to invest in fixed income maybe five to six percent at this moment is possible at some point of time the rate was mm -hmm. 11 to or 12 but you have to think about that's 10 to 12 percent of fixed deposit rate own sustain for uh, 10 it's to not 15. sustainable yes so you have to think about that but if at, say 10 years later economy started to slow down growing at mm -hmm. four to five percent rate and inflation is three percent then 12 to 15 percent will be very much uh, difficult so if you take that 15 to 20 years horizon you have to take that into account also so in that figure i think uh, 10 to 12 percent is, is is very good return and if someone achieves 14 to 15 percent that's outstanding but of course it but is. i mean you, what's your opportunity cost here you yes. can either put your money in the bank which will give you probably five six percent at this point uh, or probably even eight nine percent in general in la probably next or last 10 years and you can put your money in real estate which is generating even lower return yes. than that uh, yeah of course you can go for Sanchai Potro but that's 
probably a limited uh, amount of money that and you can invest. And also that rate will stay at this 10-11% at this for the next 15 years. So yeah, if you go to someone, uh, some investor in the stock market and tell him or her that you you, you should be happy with 12% return, you will, he or she will probably laugh at you. Yes. But yes. That's the rational thing, yes. you know, to expect. Yes. Yes. Uh, to in, with 12%, you should be very happy. Yes, I, I, I think that's mainly because of the lack of understanding of the economy and how much growth is possible. And also, as you, your economy is growing and the base is getting higher, uh, mm -hmm. the growing at the same rate will be very difficult. Difficult. And also, some point of time, people think, okay, if market goes 10 to 12% rate, I can achieve 15 or 20 or 25% because I'm superior. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that comes with overconfidence bias. But uh, I think. And that will be extremely outstanding, uh, like achieving uh, 20 or 25 percent rate. And also, you have to take into that. Yeah, you can time. do that for one or two years. But yes. Uh, generating 20, 25 percent return for next 10 years, 20 years. It's very difficult. Very difficult. So that, that's what I was about to say. That uh, if you see that, uh, what our people do is like they achieved say 10 percent rate in six months, then they said, oh, I achieved. 20% because it's annualized. <laughs> uh, so if they achieve like 20% in one year, they think like they will be able to grow at that level for the next 15, 20 years. Right. But I, I think that is uh, the lack of understanding about the uh, long-term growth. Right. Uh, so g given that you are in your current role as head of equity research, uh, what do you think, where, where can we improve in equity research especially uh, going forward? I think industry uh, again uh, at its very mature stage. We can, um, it's like uh, if if you see that uh, people doing research, all we all are very young, so we don't have enough uh, experience. So I think there is plenty of opportunity to improve. So uh, being a research analyst, I think uh, we, we we need to read a lot, read a lot about the macroeconomy, a lot about the world economy and how that is translated into uh, our investment growth and also how different sectors will do. Uh, so I, th I think uh, we are very lazy uh, as a research analyst. I think we should be uh, very hardworking. Uh, so uh, by lazy we mean uh, since our market is not that uh, efficient, so when there is a good news or bad news comes in the market, the prices doesn't adjust it's like instantly. Right. It takes a bit time. So that that is actually beneficial for us because we get enough time <laughs> to doing research. Right. Uh, but when markets will become efficient and people tend to act very quickly, uh, then you won't have enough time. So uh, you have to be well prepared. So I think uh, our, our research uh, analysts, there are many research analysts coming in the economy at this moment who has one to two years of experience. And even, even my experience is very short, I think five to six years of experience is not enough uh, for uh, being a very good uh, equity research analyst. So I think we have a lot to improve. Uh, and also we can learn from other research analysts who work like uh, in other countries, right. uh, how other researchers analyzing like say... Probably take the best practices from them. Yes, yeah, say analyzing Apple or Google or other uh, companies. So we can take the best practices and we can implement here. But there are some challenges in Bangladesh economy mm. because there is not enough disclosure by the company. Mm. So there is uh, problems related to corporate governance. You can see a company selling very good product, revenue growing, income is taking but they are not distributing the dividend or they don't have any plan to distribute the dividend because right. of the lack of corporate governance. So those are the uh, other issues that you have to take account for Bangladesh. But uh, when you take the best practices from uh, other economies like India or US or other countries, I think uh, we, we can learn a lot from uh, like veteran research analysts. Great. Let's talk about asset management industry. You have worked as a fund, a fund manager in uh, in your prior role, uh, so I would ju just uh, like, to, like to ask you why we are not seeing a strong uptick in mutual fund industry, especially given the low interest rate environment and, and the fact that our fund managers have actually done reasonably well in recent times. Uh, so what could be the potential catalyst for growth in this industry? I think uh, this industry uh, has huge op opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I could share that when I uh, left the asset management industry and gone for mm -hmm. the sales side analyst, mm -hmm. everyone was skeptical and they think uh, that I was taking the reverse uh, strategy and it, it was reverse, usually people come from sales side right. to buy side, but I started my buy side, then come to sell side. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, one of the reasons I think uh, this industry has the opportunity to grow, but uh, that growth may not take place in the next five to seven years. 
So in my career, I don't want to see a situation where asset management industry will grow, but that growth takes place after uh, my retirement. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, coming back to your question, uh, one of the reasons why it uh, haven't grown because people don't understand uh, the, like uh, what mutual fund is. Uh, so there is a lack of trust. Uh, so we can trust bank that they will pay my repay my deposit, but we do not have that trust that on t- in terms of uh, asset management industry. But uh, here, uh, actually, if you look at the, uh, how asset management industry is being formed, so there is trustee and there is custodian and uh, there is bank. So ultimately, uh, the asset management industry, the fund managers have to repay the money. So there is right. no option. And we have seen in the last year, two of the fund uh, got closed and people got very good return. Mm-hmm. So uh, ultimately, there is lack of trust, lack of understanding of the mutual fund industry. And also, uh, our retail investors have an understanding that uh, 12 to 13 percent return is not good. Uh, so you mentioned that some of the asset managers are producing very good return, but that good is actually according to our definition of 12 to 13 percent mm-hmm. return. But mm-hmm. retail investors think I can generate 15 or 20 or 25 percent return by listening to some uh, gurus, mm-hmm. investment gurus, and then uh, they can replicate that. So why I should uh, invest in uh, mutual funds? So the, the, that notion is there, which is I think a fallacy, uh, which. Uh, they will understand over time. And also another thing, if you look at the asset management industry, uh, here uh, most of the asset management companies are formed by individuals or group of individuals. So there is not many companies with a good corporate uh, structure coming in. Recently, IDLC got the asset management license and they are coming with a, uh, an open-end fund. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and also recently have seen that uh, Citibank board approved mm-hmm. an asset management company. Also, I think uh, Bragg is coming with an asset management company. So those will take place. So when you see asset management companies run by like board of banks, mm-hmm. so then they will see they, there's a bank name, like say right. Citibank or Bragg Bank mm-hmm. or IDLC, a non-banking financial institution. Mm-hmm. So if the trust uh, NBFI and if they trust the bank, they will trust the asset managers also. So, so first problem in the, in the asset management industry is the lack of trust. So that is where even we see some of the funds are generating very good return. I would say like VIPB generated very good return and also when I was in Asian Tiger, mm-hmm. uh, though it's a very short period of time of two years, mm-hmm. but I think in that period we have uh, generated a very good return compared to the market. But people are not trusting the actual product. They don't have the understanding what is mutual fund and whether I should invest in mutual fund because they don't believe like uh, after five or ten years they um, the asset get their money back. Yes. So that is the main uh, problem. And also in terms of return, uh, if you look at the asset management industry, it's been concentrated among two or three players. So those who are actually having a very good return, their size of the uh, fund is very low compared to the total size of the asset management industry. And also the asset management industry size compared to the market is very low. Very low. So some of the some of the asset managers haven't uh, like shown enough good performance and also uh, there is doubt regarding their investment quality. Uh, some investors in the private equity uh, and those private equity has a lot of conflict of interest. and actually people don't trust the net asset value of those funds. Mm. Uh, so I, th- I think from that uh, some of the asset managers are learning. So they are trying to do well and I think over three to five years there will be a level of competition and once uh, the good names with bank names mm. come in with a good corporate governance and there is a good amount of checks and balance with they have good manpower mm. who can invest very well. So I think in the, in the next five to ten years this industry will grow, but uh, in the next two to three years I see these things to take place. In fact, I think for this asset management industry, I think 2021 and 2022 is very important because that's why majority of the closed in farm will be closed. Right. So then people, you will see a lot of open end farms. So in our uh, asset management industry, you can see a lot of closed in farm compared mm. to open end farm. Right. So where in other countries there is Quite no the open end fund. So where when it is an open end fund, so asset managers has the incentive because if it don't perform well, because people will take their money back. Right. If they do well, a lot of money will comes in. But in case of closed end fund, you just sit there and getting the management fee. So I think asset managers should be on their toes to generate return, and I think uh, open end fund uh, can do well in that year compared to closed end fund. 
you already mentioned the word trust when you discussed about the banking sector i think it is equally relevant if not more yes. when it comes to asset management yes. i think it's irrelevant for the whole financial services in general yes. you have to gain the trust yes because what you are dealing your probably primary product is a trust yes right uh, so so that that was a very compelling argument that you, you made uh, for generating trust in the industry in the asset management asset management industry so we are probably in the final stage of the our discussion uh, we usually ask our guests about the stock picks long term stock picks that you can suggest to our listeners uh, so what do you have in your bag uh, i think um, at this moment since it's 2017 and a lot of uh, closed mutual funds will be closed by 2021 2022 so i think having a five years of uh, time horizon and a uh, lot of the mutual funds are trading at very deep discount uh, if you say the current discount level it uh, so you do trust the fund manager that they uh, will pay back the money uh, i do trust some fund managers and i don't trust some other fund managers so okay. i don't want to mention the name because right. i think uh, when people want to invest in mutual funds i think thing worth mentioning hmm. uh, not all mutual funds are alike so if you want to invest in mutual funds you have to do research as well right. uh, so there's common understanding so i invest in mutual fund and i lost money so mutual fund is not a good product actually you have to do the research right. as well uh, who is the fund manager what is their capability what is their uh, history of Check generating returns. return right. and also the governance of the board and investment committee because if the fund manager is good but there is the investment committee there is not enough checks and balance so at some point of time they may not perform well right. so i th- i think that's research is very uh, important so i think uh, having 5 to 6 years of time close in mutual funds trading at 25 to 30% discount with a uh, good portfolio at this moment closed and funds disclose their portfolios on their website on a quarterly basis so you need to see their portfolio whether they have investment in private equity or how much and how much in the public equity and where they are actually investing so that's why you get some sort of insight about the thought process of the uh, fund manager which which fund managers do you have in mind uh, you don't uh, have to mention the negative one uh, just uh, mention uh, as the positive uh, that the uh, one uh, you uh, see in positive light yes i i would say where i have my investment because uh, i i invested um, uh, funds managed by three uh, asset managers uh, one is the vibb who has generated very good return in the 5 to uh, 6 years uh, i have investment in Uh, ATC SLGF uh, managed by Asian Capital Partners, and I was there for a couple of years. Um, and also, I, I invested some funds uh, managed by Ella Global. Um, so these are the three funds. Uh, I think uh, Ella Global funds are trading at much more discount compared to ATC SLGF. And uh, yeah. obviously, uh, since VIPB generated very good return and with a very good track record, so uh, their discount is a lot lower. But even I think 10% discount is uh, very good uh, if you. trust that asset managers will be able to generate or able to beat the market another thing you need to look at that beating the market uh, by mutual fund after taking it on the cost so fees are around 3 to 4% so if they beat the market after fees so they are actually beat the market by a huge margin, huge margin. before uh, fees because index doesn't have any cost yeah. so uh, so i think i think i think close to, and also i think Uh, there is another fund uh, which recently launched managed by vanger uh, their portfolio looks well and i think uh, for that you have to have a bit higher time horizon of right. 9 to uh, to see years. whether the track record yes. actually matches yes. Yes. Uh, what we are probably looking for and also apart from uh, it's like uh, mutual funds right. i think uh, the pharmaceutical industry is very sweet spot and uh, the pharmaceutical industry is likely to grow at around 13 to 15% over time in the next 5 to 10 years in my opinion mm-hmm. so i think i think the market leaders first two or three companies will do uh, very well as the industry will grow market leaders will get the benefit and also i think that with young economy huge data penetration i think the tech industry is very sweet spot so i think uh, you can invest in tech but also i think uh, some banks with consumer lending exposure uh, because banks that have heavy corporate exposure are much more risky nowadays so i think banks that have good management and managed by very good mds i think uh, having good consumer exposure because as the economy will grow so there will be increased financial inclusion so more uh, income earned by uh, return on equity will be higher for the companies uh, that will have larger consumer uh, base with well diversified uh, lending portfolio so i think uh, some of the you know, one nba one or two nbfi and a few 
three to four banks will be which which mm. banks or nvfs do you have in mind yeah, I, I think uh, i'll be very comfortable investing in idlc having very good track record um, uh, showing very good uh, performance in the last uh, 10 to 5 to 10 years and also um, i think uh, investing in brag having because under their belt and also the, the actual bank is doing very well. Uh, I think uh, Eastern Bank Limited is doing very well and also I would say Citibank though I work under uh, Citibank so there is a general bias uh, but I would say that bank is also uh, doing very well. Okay. Okay. Any book suggestion uh, for our listeners? Uh, I, th- I, th- I always suggest uh, books uh, to my uh, students. As you know, I run an uh, institution which cater to the right. uh, needs of uh, CFA candidates and FRM candidates. So I always suggest them uh, books. Uh, so I think uh, currently I'm reading a book on macroeconomy. Uh, the name of the book is Breakout Nation by Ruchi Sharma. Mm-hmm. That's a very good uh, book so if you want to figure out which country is likely to grow or which country grown in the last 15-20 years and why, what are the reasons, so I think that's a very good book. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I read another macro book on macroeconomics uh, last year, is um, uh, it's like The Only Game in Town uh, by uh, Mohammed al mm-hmm. uh, Another book I read last year is The Fault Line uh, by Raghuram Rajan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think these are the books on macroeconomics uh, is very good. Uh, if you want to uh, read on decision making, behavioral finance, uh, I read uh, Think Fast and Slow. Uh, I would recommend uh, reading this book at least once in a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, another book, another, a couple of books by Richard Taylor, uh, Nudge and Misbehaving. I read this uh, last year, so these mm-hmm. are very uh, good books. Uh, for investors, I would say uh, reading uh, The uh, Intelligent Investor is, is a very good book. Uh, they can read books. Uh, written Timeless by, book, probably. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. written book by uh, like Peter Lynch, Beating the Street. And there are many other books. Uh, you, you can come out with a lot of good ideas of reading books. But every book gives some sort of ideas. And some ideas may be relevant for, say, in the 90s is at 2000, some are not relevant for 2020. So right. you have to understand the changing environment. But by reading books, you get a lot many ideas. And also, apart from reading books, I think investors can follow uh, the, uh, the shareholder letter of Warren Buffett and also uh, Howard Mark uh, of Oak Tree Capital. He, mm-hmm. he, he, his uh, website, you, you can see a lot of letters and uh, he has been praised by Warren Buffett also uh, mm-hmm. for those uh, shareholder returns. So I think we, we, we can read a lot about those. Uh, so I think these are the names in the people that follow. Thank you so much, Hafiz Bhai, for your time and it has been a real pleasure uh, for our listeners as well as me to have you in our show. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you.